Well, happy Sabbath, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, the second study today. So I was thankful for Dwight's study, and we're going to sort of continue with some of that. Um, but before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? <clears throat> Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we are thankful for the time that we have here uh, to open your word together and to share with one another uh, the things that you have been doing in our lives throughout these past years. And we ask, Lord, for encouragement and correction that your Holy Spirit can bring uh, the conviction of sin, reveal your righteousness and your judgment, and be a comforter in, in the process. We pray for your angels' care and protection for our loved ones, and we are so thankful for this Sabbath and the time that we have together. May your Holy Spirit be here and speak to our hearts. We pray this and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, happy Sabbath again. Now, you know, God in his providence has uh, done an awful lot in in our lives and in this movement. And uh, what Dwight shared this morning, I think, was in God's providence. Now, I've been struggling to to try to decide what to present. So on Friday nights, you know, we have a study on righteousness by faith and and I do want to do a study dealing with uh, chronology um, on Sabbath afternoons. And in, do, in, in so doing, let's see here, I see got a lot of spaces, more spaces I need. Sorry about that. Um, in so doing, I, I want to, to bring this chronology, this study that we've been doing on chronology, um, in relationship to the third angel's message and and the work of righteousness that God has been doing in our lives. That is, you know, I could do a study on chronology that's rather dry, um, you know, dealing with dates and details and so forth. Now, I was looking through some of my papers, and I wrote a paper uh, back in 2019. Um, I'm trying to remember when I wrote this exactly. Now, if I look at the info on this paper, it's going to say, um, so created September 20th, 2019. Um, though it says I last printed it September 16th, 2019. So I'm not sure. Kind of that small. Means. It's kind of small. I can't read it. Yeah, I know. That's okay. You don't need to read it. I'm reading it for you. <laughs> okay. okay. Yeah. So, so that just. You know, so it, it was anyway back in September of 2019. Now, in September of 2019, uh, this is going to be shortly after um, we have that situation with um, Harminder's movement. So I started to put together this paper. Now, normally when I write a paper, I write it in, um, you know, I use the pronoun we. I don't, I don't usually refer to I. Even when I'm talking about my personal experience, um, when we're talking about um, not, you know, I'm going to be saying, uh, you know, we, or I'll say, you know, the author or something like that. But usually I like to use this inclusive we rather than I. So this paper I wrote in the first person. Now, um, so... So I, I talk about that in this paper. Now, I'm going to probably try to finish this paper, I guess. So I said this paper is entitled A Testimony, Confession, Apology, and Defense. But that is what it is. Um, and and it, it's somewhat lighter than it is, but even though it's a, a, a deadly serious topic. Um, but in this paper, the idea is that I wanted just to be a bit more personable. Now, I don't know if that was a really good idea when I read over the paper, I was kind of like, eh, I don't know if I would really want people to read this paper. Um, and, and part of it is, um, uh, you know, because I'm talking so much about myself, I use the word I in here a lot. So it has a seeming pretentiousness 
But the idea is to kind of tell it as a story to keep people's interest. And of course, when you tell a story, um, you want to tr- sort of include the person in a story that they, they sort of feel a part of that story. And, and so, you know, I'll probably end up writing this as a paper. We're not going to go through this right, right now, but I, I just want to say that, um, I do think it's important that each one of us looks back upon our experience um, in prayer. That is, we need to examine our own hearts. And, and that's what I was doing in writing out this paper, is I was rehearsing the sacred history of my own life, how God had had first led me to know him. And... You know, the one thing we cannot ask of each other is for somebody to just cast aside uh, their Christian experience based upon something we believe. So, um, and, and often we expect people to do that, right? So we may have some view or idea that we believe and, and we're talking to someone else. And and we share this idea. And if that person is discerning, they start to look at this idea and say, how does this idea affect who I am as a person? How does it affect my Christian experience? Right. So if somebody comes to you and says, um, you know, I I found that the 2300 days has no basis in reality. The Seventh day Adventists were wrong. Um and and I can show you why it was wrong. Um, they're they're actually and and that we just need to accept what they're saying, without all of the other implications that it has. There, that is, there's implications not just intellectually, but into in, implications to our own experience. Now, now if somebody comes with something that's true, I mean it, it's still the same. I mean I may believe certain things. I may be a Sunday keeper. And somebody comes along and says, well, you know, I found that Saturday is the Sabbath. Now, if I'm going to change from being a Sunday keeper to being a Sabbath keeper, there are implications in regard to my previous experience, right? That is, I may have been a Christian and I may have been keeping Sunday and I may have had reasons for keeping Sunday. I may even have known about the Sabbath that the Sabbath is Saturday, but I have some reasoning that I've been depending upon uh, in order to continue keeping Sunday. And somebody comes with information now that I start to see some things a little bit differently. Now, there has to be a consistency in God's leading in the past with me now changing my view from no longer keeping Sunday to keeping the Sabbath. Correct? Yes. Right? That is, if God was leading me in the past in my Christian experience, I I don't just cast aside everything that was in my Christian experience and say, oh, my Christian experience was completely wrong. I would see that there is a connection to how God led me in the past with what I'm experiencing in the present even if it comes to changing a view or an idea, right? So so I, I wouldn't say, well, God wasn't leading me at all in my life because I was keeping the wrong day. And, and I may even have experienced blessings in keeping Sunday, right? You know, I, I'd have this one day off a week and I'd spend it with my family and uh, we found it a blessing and a joy. And then... And then comes along this Sabbath and I start to realize I was keeping the wrong day. But there would have to be a consistency that I would see that even in my ignorance, God allowed me to have a blessing on the Sunday. Even though I didn't, even though it's the wrong day and I didn't know it. Right now, if I had known it was the wrong day and I continued in disobedience of God. Could I receive a blessing in quotation marks by keeping the Sunday? This is an important question. So if I knew it to be the right, 
not progressing in your Christian experience. Right. I would find that if later I had come to recognize that I was wrong, I would recognize the curse that it had been in keeping the Sunday, right? That is, our attitude about about light is absolutely important. And I've known people who have gone against God knowingly, um, knowing better, and when they had repented of it, they would see the damage that had occurred, right? So you could have a person who has kept Sunday in ignorance and received a blessing, but you would not have a person who kept Sunday knowingly that it was wrong, that he had all the evidences, but he was in rebellion to God, who could receive a blessing. He wouldn't receive a blessing, right? Because he knows he's in opposition to God. And, and he might keep the Sunday. Maybe it's because, you know, his relatives do. Or maybe it has to do with his job. I know people who have who have transgressed the Sabbath um, because of their job. And and they didn't go about saying, well, you know, I decided to keep Sunday instead. And that was a blessing, you know, and I was wrong now. But God still blessed me in keeping Sunday. No, they would say. The people that I've known that that there was a curse in disobeying God knowing. So the one thing we do know is that in our experience, we can we can see God's leading if we advance step by step. That is, God br- brings light to us. And when we receive light, he gives us more light, right? So all of us have a progression of an experience. And um, so I, I want to do a study you know, dealing with chronology, but have it much more founded in our experience. That is the experience of us individually in this movement and the experience of the movement itself. So we had some discussion in in Dwight's study regarding Elder Jeff and the role that he's now taking in writing these articles. Um, In some of the articles, he rejects uh, July 18, 2020, as a sin that has to be repented of. And he has also publicly stated that we cannot use the symbolic use of numbers and dates, that, that this is a deception or a sin. And and what we would have to do in, in evaluating this, there's lots of different ways that we can evaluate this. And I think the best way to evaluate it is to rehearse our history in this movement. What was taught in the past and why we continue to follow on to ultimately make this July 18, 2020 prediction and why we can't set that aside and believe that God was leading us. So hopefully people are. um, So which video does Jeff speak? That's going to be a December 20, December 30th, 2023. So um, two weeks ago. So that's going to be the video. It's uh, um, if somebody could give a link to that video there for Ron, right? So so Jeff just joins in the study with uh, the American group, I think it is, or Canadian group. I can't remember. I think it's the American group. <clears throat> so if somebody can put up, usually Iran can find that link. And put it up. Okay, so so we have this issue existing within the movement. Now we could say, well, we were in ignorance, right? That is, we just we followed something out of ignorance. We didn't know better, and so God still could have been leading us. But now we know better, right? So that would be an argument that would be made. Um. But if God was leading us, why was he leading us in this particular way? Now, I believe that there is a solution to that problem, which 
has been presented for years now in our studies. And that is that God had allowed us to follow the pattern of Millerite history so that we could experience um, the disappointment of the Millerites. So that means July 18, 2020 has a parallel with the experience of the Millerites of October 22, 1844. Now, in the lines, we can see that July 18th also parallels Samuel Snow's letters. That is, we understand that our line is typical, and Samuel Snow's letters are typical of October 22, 1844. And October 22, 1844 symbolizes the Sunday law in Jeff's line, right? So you have 9-11 is the first day of the first month. There's midnight in the midnight cry, July 21st, August 15th, fifth day of the fourth month, first day of the fifth month. And then there's the 10th day of the seventh month. And we have come to understand that 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 line that Jeff had is really a zoom into the arrival of the second angel's message on Ellen White's line, where the second angel's message is Revelation 18 that joins uh, with the third angel's message. We also understood in our study of uh, A.T. Jones' Uh, 1893 General Conference Bulletin, uh, that in that history, that mighty angel of Revelation 18 also came down, just as it did at 9-11, right? So that means uh, the second angel had joined the third angel. That's what Jones believed, and Ella White seems to support that idea. Um, but the Sunday law never materialized in that history. And so there are some very uh, complicated ways of thinking are, um, I guess, involved, involved ways of understanding this, how how something happened in the past and God was leading and things did not come out the way that they expected. We have had the same thing in our history. We have these disappointments of that occur. And, and these are in God's providence. They're part of his leading. It's a repeat of history. Um. And and there was a uh, a quote which I had read during the White study. <clears throat> now this was um, I'm just going to read it again. Um, now this is dealing with Revelation five verse one to three that Ellen White says I saw on the right hand of him that sat on the throne a, ro- a book written within and on the back side. Sealed with seven seals. He'll bring this up so you can see it. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. She then says, there in his open hand lay the book, the role of the histories of God's providences, so, so in this book sealed with seven seals, it's, it's the role of the history of God's providences. Now, what is a providence? We use this word all the time. How could we look at this word? If we said providences, would that give us an understanding of the, of the significance of this word? Because we think provide, of it, you're saying to provide. Right. So it's provide is the root of it, right? It's his providences okay pronounce yeah. providences. but god provides something now now my brother dave he he never liked using the word luck he would never say something was lucky he would always say it was providential because he he took that everything that happens to us comes through god's hands and that something that seems you know fortunate right which is the idea of luck or fortune uh, really is something that God has provided. And, and we always look for God to provide for us. In our Christian experience, we talk of the providences, of the way God orders and events in our lives that have led us uh, to recognize ourselves as sinners and uh, to choose to follow God. It's in his providences that these things occur. They're not initiated because we initiated them, God in his providence 
has brought us to a point where we then see uh, a step that we have to take, right? So this is contained in this book, right? This book also contains the prophetic history of nations and the church, right? So this is a prophetic book that is in the hand of this lamb that um, is going to be able to open this book. It's it's a lamb that had seven horns and ten eyes. It's as it had been slain. It doesn't mention that here. It's going to mention it later. Um, so so this is a prophetic book. It contains the history of nations and the church. Now, would that book contain the history of this movement? Yes, it would. Yeah. Yeah. And 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 the history of this movement in connection with the history of nations and, and what's happening in the world around us. We would have to say yes, right, as you say. Now, in this book is also contained the divine utterances. So what is a divine utterance? I would say it's something that God inspires us to say, like a prophecy. Okay, well, this would be something that God has said, right? So it contains what God has spoken to mankind, right? That's his laws, his words, right? Now, it has his authority, right? In, in it is contained his authority, his commandments, his laws, right? Those are what are the divine utterances. They're being expressed as his authority, his commandments, his laws. All that God has said to humanity is contained in this prophetic book that is sealed with seven seals, but it's going to be open in the hand, right, of you know, here it's going to be seen open in his hand. So we're going to look at that a little bit more. Um, so it's in the right hand of, of him that sat on the throne, written within and on in the backside, sealed with seven seals. But it's going to be open in, in, in his hand. So it's one thing I, I need to focus on, that it's going to be opened, right? Um, and, and this book contains the whole symbolic counsel of the eternal. So why does it contain symbolic counsel? So it has these plain utterances, the divine utterances, his authority, his commandments, his laws. It contains prophetic history of the nations and the church. But this whole symbolic counsel of the eternal. Why? Why is there symbolic counsel of the eternal contained in this book? Why symbols? Why do we use symbols? You know, just us. It helps us to identify more of what is prophetic and what is literal. Okay. Well, yeah. So you're thinking more in a biblical sense, but let's say I use uh, the Greek letter pi. Right. Um, that's kind of a shorthand for writing out uh, a number that would take a long time to write out, probably eternity. Right. Agreed. Right. So we use symbols. Because symbols contain so much more than the symbol has. That is, they contain a whole wealth of knowledge can be contained in a symbol. And so God uses symbols to communicate with us because those symbols can show so much more than if we just spoke directly. Right. So God has this direct speaking. He, he lays out his law, his, his utterances, his authority, his commandments. It's, it's a kind of shorthand, God shorthand. That's why Palmoni, Christ, the wonderful numberer, he is the one that created this universe that is based upon math, mathematics. And, and mathematics can contain a bunch of information in symbols. So numbers are symbols. It's one of the things that are symbols. There's lots of things that are symbols, but numbers are one thing that is symbols. Now, it has... Uh, the history of all ruling powers in the nations. Now, why all ruling powers? What is that including? That doesn't mean just the men who are rulers, but also uh, the principalities and powers, the wickedness in high places, right? That, that there is um, 
that there is in, in this, the ruling powers of nations, all of them, we can see that Satan is, is the prince of the power of the air, right? Okay, that makes sense. And then she says, in symbolic language was contained in that role, the influence of every nation, tongue, and people from the beginning of Earth's history to its close. So this book contains the entire history of the world from the beginning to its end. Okay. So what is this book? Isn't it, isn't it kind of a blueprint for our time? Okay. But more specifically, what is this book? Now, Ron put it's, it's the Bible. Is, is he correct there? Little book of Daniel. I'm gonna get that. Okay, so so because this book is gonna be opened right in his hand. So so let's let's read Revelation five here. Uh, I saw on the right hand of him that sat upon the throne, written within and on the backside, sealed with seven seals. Now, if you go through a study in the spirit of prophecy, you'll see the one seated upon the throne is Christ, and that he's seated upon the throne in. Uh, chapter four, Revelation in chapter four. So that's going to be uh, the table of showbread that's representing Christ's throne. He has a rainbow above his head. Um, and Ellen White says that Christ points to the rainbow above his own head in describing this scene. So it's clear that it's actually the son of God in heaven that's seated upon this throne. It's not the father. You'll see most people think it's the father, but it's actually the son. It's Christ. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and read the book, neither to look thereon. And wonders, uh, one of the elders said, saith unto me, weep not. Behold, the line of the tribe of Judah the root of David hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. So we're going to see that it's the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. This is going to be Christ. He's going to prevail. He hath prevailed in this context to open the book and loose the seven seals. And I beheld and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. So if the one seated upon the throne is Christ, and the one that's able to open this book is this lamb that is sealed, or the lamb that has seven horns and seven eyes, so he can open up this book, which are the seven spirits of God. Is this also Christ? And why is Christ seated upon the throne, not able to open the book? But why is this lamb that is also called uh, the line of the tribe of Judah able to open the book? That's the question. He's the one that gives the gives prophecy. OK, but he also fulfills prophecy. So, yes, if Christ, if Christ had stayed in heaven. And not come to earth as a man and died for our sins. Could he have unsealed this book? The thing that unseals this book is the death of Christ. Okay. So then, to, <clears throat> so then to answer your question directly, the answer would have been no. Okay. So, uh, and the question was, what was the question <laughs> that you're answering no to? If Christ had remained in heaven, had not become a man, yeah, he then have unsealed this book. Right. Yeah, because I did ask another question, too. Um, and so the question is that there is a difference between Christ seated upon the throne, right? And Christ as a lamb that it has been slain. Right. So Christ seated upon the throne can't open the book. But Christ slain can. And this is a key to understanding this book. So first, uh, 
This book is sealed. Is the Bible sealed? Well, verse 3 says that no man in heaven. So it's a man that can open the book. So Christ had to come as a man. I feel right. if a man was going to open the book. I would say Christ uh, could open the book, but he wasn't credited as being a man prior, so he could have opened it prior, but not as a man. Well, I, I, yeah, I, I kind of see what you're saying. But, I mean, you could just say no one. So in heaven or in earth could open this book. It would require Christ to come and be become a man, right, and to die for our sins in order to open this book that's been sealed, right? So the question is, uh, is, is the Bible a sealed book? Well, according to Isaiah 28, I believe it's where they say I can't read this because it's sealed. I'm unlearned. And I think regarding Christ dying, I mean, he paid so much for our lives. And the more we die to self, the more God will reveal to us. Yeah, I think it's 29. It's Isaiah 29. Um, so Isaiah 29, verse 11. Um and the vision of all has become unto you as the words of a book that is sealed, which men deliver to one that is learned, saying, read this, I pray thee. And he saith, I cannot, for it is sealed. And the book is delivered uh, to him that is not learned, saying, read this, I pray thee. And he saith, I'm not learned. Right. So. But that doesn't really say that the Bible is. Is sealed. We, we do know the book of Daniel is sealed. Right. So, so we do know that about the about the book of Daniel, and and how is Daniel unsealed? Uh, there is a part of uh, the book of Daniel which is uh, which was unsealed. Then, uh, with us, by understanding Daniel chapter eleven verse forty to forty five, which simply means uh, the old Bible now is unsealed. Yeah. Okay. So. So we, we know that the book of Daniel is a book that's specifically marked as being sealed. Right? Daniel 12, verse 14. Without Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, which is an idiom to mean to study, and knowledge shall be increased. So so the book of Daniel is is sealed. And, and then we're going to have a book in Revelation uh, chapter 5 that is sealed with seven seals and and those seven seals have to be unsealed. Now those seven seals are going to be um, described in, in prophetically uh, beginning with chapter six. So chapter six is gonna be this history that uh, unseals this book, right? Now, we're saying that, that the one that's going to unseal the book is this lamb that had been, that is as it had been slain. He's going to prevail. He has prevailed. Uh, and he is able to open this book, right? And he takes it out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And it says, and when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the lamb having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sung a new song saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. But thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. And hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. And I beheld and heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and the beast and the elders, and the number of them was ten thousands, then ten thousand times ten thousand, and thousands of thousands. So it's a lot. Saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. So that's seven different things that he is to receive, right? And every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and such as are in the sea, and all that are in them, heard I saying, 
blessing and honor and glory and power. This time four things. Be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the lamb forever and ever. And the four beasts said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshiped him that liveth forever and ever. So when we read this, we know that the book of Revelation is written in symbolic language as well. It's not, you know, there was not a scene where there was a lamb that had seven horns and seven eyes uh, that was literally there, right? It's not describing something that's literal. It's describing something that's symbolic. Right. So often people, when they look at this, you know, they say, well, you got the lamb, you know, he takes this book from the one seated upon the throne. So the one seated upon the throne must be the father because the lamb is Christ. But we can see that it's, it's showing an exchange in symbolic language. And, and we're going to have more symbolic language, which is going to describe the opening of these seals. And these seals are going to be opened. Because Ellen White says it contains in prophetic, prophetic language, symbolic language, the prophecies that relate to these nations and kingdoms all throughout scripture, right from the beginning of time to the second coming, right? To the close of this earth's history. Now, I'm not going to go into this in detail. I mean, we're not going to go through the seven seals, but we understand that there's going to be these seals that are unsealed, right? There's going to be the description of the 144,000, and then you're going to have the seventh seal, right? And then you're going to have the seven trumpets. And then finally, um, you're going to have in Revelation 10, another mighty angel come down from heaven. Uh, yeah, uh, Kelly says a reality described in symbolic language yes so there's a reality um described in symbolic language and i saw another mighty angel come down from heaven clothed with the cloud the rainbow was upon his head and his face as it were the sun and his feet as pillars of fire so this is christ and he had in his hand a little book opened and he set his right foot upon the sea and his left foot on the earth and he cried with a loud voice as when a lion roareth and when he had cried seven thunders uttered their voices so here we have a little book open. Now we know this little book is the book of Daniel, right? That's, right. There's no question about him. So now this one's described as a little book. Now the other one is just a book sealed with seven seals. It doesn't say it's a little book, but we have a little book that's opened. Okay. And we know it's the book of Daniel. Now, what we could say, if we're going to look at this book that's sealed with seven seals, is that in some ways we can say the Bible is sealed. That is, that there's something that that Christ needed to do in order for uh, the scriptures to speak more clearly uh, than they would before Christ came and died. Because all of the prophecies, remember, on the road to Emmaus, um, on the third day after, you know, the crucifixion, um, Jesus is going to explain to them in all the scriptures, the things uh, that relate to him, right? He's going to show all these prophecies. And, and until Christ comes and dies, in a sense, those things are sealed. But it's, it's the prophecies of the Bible, the symbolic language of the Bible that becomes unsealed. Now, when we deal with this, if we're wanting to understand this, we would have to go to Daniel chapter 9, right? So in Daniel chapter 9, we're going to have some symbolic language. This symbolic language is the language of the 70 weeks. And there's many things like this in Scripture. You have, of course, Daniel chapter 8. You have Daniel chapter 12. We have all of these different places where, where numbers are used as symbols. And so in da Daniel 9, verse 24, when it says 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish transgression, etc. right? And, and we're going to have this, um, this, the seven weeks, the three score and two weeks, and then you're going to have the 70th week. 
Why has this been put in symbolic language? And could we understand this um, without understanding this language as symbolic? Could, if, if we didn't understand this was, was symbolic, could we apply it to Christ? Probably not. No, no we, we, we wouldn't because we would take, we would take these weeks as actual literal weeks, wouldn't we? Right. Okay. But also there's a bunch of symbols here, uh, that we would need to understand. And that is that, that there are people who read this without understanding its symbolic language and they apply it to a Thai kiss epiphanies and, and all different ways in which this is interpreted or understood. Now, one of the things that we have learned in this movement is that um, this 70 weeks is connected to the 70 years, right? And this isn't well understood generally, that um, when we look at, at, at Daniel chapter 9 and we start, and this movement is understood, that he's going to be studying to understand the 70 years. Now he's going to be looking at the prophet Jeremiah. Now Daniel was taken captive. Um, like we're talking about the first year of Darius. So he knows that he's been in captivity. He was taken captivity in 607 BC in the fall. And he knows that the 70 years are near up. But he also knows that there's 70 years for Babylon, right? That's in the book of Jeremiah. And, and that there's 70 years at Babylon. That's going to be coming up. So he is trying to understand this period of 70 years. And then God's going to give him a prophecy of 70 weeks. So why does God do that? What is it that Daniel comes to understand um, in Daniel 9-11 that becomes important as a symbol? He says, Yea, all Israel have transgressed thy law, even by departing, that they might not obey thy voice. Therefore, the curse is poured upon us, and the oath that is written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, because we have sinned against him. So what is it that Daniel is recognizing when he's studying this, these 70 years? He uses this word oath written in the law of Moses. That is the seven times. So what is he recognizing about the 70 years? So he's recognizing that the 70 years are connected to Leviticus 26, right? The oath written in the law of Moses. He's also recognizing that it's a probationary time. Yes, and that there is a promise that's given, right? And and that promise is given. Exactly. Um, let me see here. Uh, I'm trying to find the verse. Yeah. So in verse 43, um, um, the land also shall be left of them and shall enjoy her Sabbaths while she lieth desolate without them. And they shall accept of the punishment of their iniquity because even because they despised my judgments and because their soul abhorred my statutes. And yet for all that, when they be in the land of their enemies, I will not cast them away. Neither will I abhor them and destroy them utterly and to break my covenant with them, for I am the Lord their God. But I will for their sakes remember the covenant of their ancestors, whom I brought forth out of the land and of Egypt, in the sight of the heathen, that I may, might be their God, and I am the Lord. Now, um, this section here, when you look at verse 34 and 35, then shall the land enjoy her Sabbath, as long as it lieth desolate, and ye be in your enemy's land. Even then shall the land rest, and enjoy her Sabbaths. As long as it lieth desolate, it shall rest, because it did not rest in your Sabbaths when ye dwelt upon it. And in Second Chronicles 36, this is going to be quoted in verse uh, 21. 
to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths. For as long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath to fulfill three score and ten years. Right. So here in this case, we can see that Daniel understands as he studies in books and also in the book of Jeremiah. So he's going to look at Leviticus 26. Now, Second Chronicles is written after the time of Daniel. So obviously he can't he can't uh, have read this because it hasn't been written yet. But the book of Jeremiah was. And here they're referring to Ezra is to the prophecy of Jeremiah. Now, in Jeremiah, uh, there is uh, the 70 years are mentioned in 25 and 29. So in Jeremiah 25, it says, Behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, saith the Lord, and Nebuchadnezzar, it says Nebuchadnezzar in, in Jeremiah, the king of Babylon, my servant, and will bring them again against this land and against the inhabitants thereof, against all these nations round about, and will utterly destroy them and make them an astonishment and a hissing and a perpetual desolations. Moreover, I will take from them the voice of mirth, the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom, and the voice of the bride, and the sound of the millstones, and the light of the candle. And the whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment. And these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. And it shall come to pass when 70 years are accomplished that I will punish the king of Babylon. So when does that happen? When is the king of Babylon punished? At the end of 70 years. When is that? Okay, I I didn't quite hear because I think two people spoke. Stephen? Belshazzar's feast. Okay, Belshazzar's feast, right? October 13th, 539. Okay, the beginning of the Jewish year 538. Okay, so after those 70 years are accomplished, uh, and then it says, I will bring upon the land all that the words that which I have pronounced against it, even all that is written in this book, which Jeremiah hath prophesied against all the nations. For many nations and great kings shall serve themselves and them also. And I will recompense them according to their deeds. So this 70 years in the first year of Darius has already been fulfilled. So Daniel knows that. But he also knows that there's 70 years mentioned in uh, Jeremiah 29. And, And this he is also recognizing and is fulfilling conditions connected to this. Um, for thus saith the Lord, that after 70 years be accomplished at Babylon. So Daniel knows personally he's been at Babylon for uh, 69, 68 years, somewhere in there. Um, when 70 years are accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you in causing you ret- to return to this place. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. Then shall ye call upon me and ye shall go and pray unto me and I will hearken unto you. And ye shall seek me and find me when ye shall search for me with all your heart. And I will be found of you, saith the Lord. And I will turn away your captivity and will gather you from all the nations and from all the places whither I have driven you, saith the Lord. And I will bring you again into the place whence I caused you to be carried away captive. Because you have said, the Lord hath raised up us up prophets in Babylon. Know, um, know that thus saith the Lord and of the king that sitteth upon the throne of David and of all the people that dwelleth in this city and of your brethren, that ye are not gone forth with you into the captivity. So there's a lot more dealing with that. So he's saying at a certain time when this 70 years are accomplished, then um, you will be able to to. Go out of captivity. So Daniel is recognizing this. He is he is recognizing that 70 years uh, for Babylon to uh, dominate the Levant is has passed. And he's looking to the 70 years um, at Babylon to end. Right. 
And that's what Daniel 9 and even Daniel 10 are really addressing, because Daniel 10, he's going to be uh, praying to God, fasting for 21 days. And at the end of 21 days, the angel is going to come to him and say, yeah, we were fighting over the mind of Cyrus, and he has now issued this decree so that the people can return uh, to the land. So the 70 years at Babylon is coming to an end, right? So, so why do I bring up this? If we're going to deal with the 70 weeks, and there's a lot more to it, because uh, even the structure of the 70 weeks themselves has all kinds of symbols. So I, I can show you this here. I'll do it this way. Yeah, just take me a second to find this. Yeah, it's not the best way to find it. Okay, so this, oh, that one's too complicated. Um, I'll do this diagram. Okay. Um, So we have the 70 week prophecy and we know that it has seven weeks, which is 49 years, 62 weeks, and then the one week. So this is a prophecy in the book of Daniel. It's symbolic language and it gives us this structure. And we know seven weeks is 49 years, which is a Jubilee cycle. And one week is a sabbatical cycle. And, and we know that uh, the building of the streets and walls is going to happen in the 20th year of Artaxerxes, 13 years after uh, the seventh year of Artaxerxes, right? So that's going to be Ezra in 457, Nehemiah in 444. And then there's 36 years uh, to the end of that seven weeks. And then we have these 62 weeks, 434 years. Now, we know that that the midst of that period of 62 years or 62 weeks, pardon me, is 191 BC. And there's 217 years if we, if we look at this as a chiasm. And 217 is 31 times seven. Now Jesus is crucified in 31 AD in the midst of the week. Is this designed by Satan or by God? Is, are the symbols there? of 31 times seven given us by God or by Satan. We would know this has to be by God, right? We know Jesus is crucified in 31 AD in the midst of the week. That is the week is divided by 31, right? And the 62 weeks is divided by 31 times seven, or we can say it's 31 times seven well, the other one is 31 divided by seven, if you understand what I'm saying, right? This is in God's plan. These are symbolic use of numbers. If this is correct, this is Palmoni at work. We also know we have a symbol for midnight. 31 times seven is 217. And 217 is July 7th. Or, or July 21st, pardon me, the seventh month, the 21st day, the 21st day of the seventh month. We have this symbol. Is this symbol created by God or Satan? By God. By God, right? That is, we have found all of these things in the 70 weeks, at the start of the 70 weeks, that connect us to 1844 through this symbolic use of numbers. If the symbolic use of numbers is ordained by God to illustrate that this history, that the foundation of Seventh-day Adventism is correct. Would we suggest that, that God would allow Satan to use it in our time to deceive us who are finding these things that support Seventh-day Adventism as being led by God? Would that make any sense at all? That these symbols were not understood until this movement came along and it supports the idea that Seventh-day Adventism is true, that the foundation of this message, uh, the 2300 days, the 70 weeks, are all ordained of God, that the Millerite history is correct. If that was of God, then this movement would have to be of God 
in understanding those symbols. There's no way that that the movement would be given these symbols by Satan to support what God has already established. And no, it, it, to me, it's impossible. It's it's yeah. it's what you call self-contradictory. So we're discovering these symbols. That is, what's being unsealed is in part this book that's sealed with seven seals, but also uh, the seven thunders are being unsealed in our history. And they're being unsealed with these time prophecies in the Old Testament scriptures. So all of this, you know, when we go through this history, because we're going to go through it, um, basically how these truths were unfolded to this movement step by step. Now, and, and for me, I know my own personal history the best, you know, how I discovered things that God was showing me once I, I started studying the 2520 and how things unfolded. And, and what Jeff is asking is he's asking me to say, well, in all of that, all of these things that God was showing this movement as well, that that was a deception of Satan. And we can see as we go through this history of this movement that that's an impossibility. If it is a deception of Satan, then Adventism is a deception of Satan. And Christianity is a deception of Satan. But that becomes self-contradictory. Yeah, so we know, as Angela's pointing out, um, that we have uh, all these chronological symbols, the sun, the moon, the stars, the planets, are all given as for signs, for seasons, for days and years, right? And, and we have all of these dates given us in the Bible. In, in Genesis dealing with the flood, all of these dates. And, and at what point are we going to say, well, we can use the symbolic numbers and, and we can't. Now, we could argue, and the main argument, and I'm just going to close right away here, but the main argument that's made is because nothing happened on July 18, it shows that we were deceived, and also we had direct counsel against time setting. But this is also true of Millerite history. Did anything visible happen on October 22nd, 1844? Not visible, but... Not visible, in, right? In heaven, in heaven, something did happen, but not visible. Right. And, and we understand that based on what? What's the supernatural event uh, that helps us understand that that, that did happen in ha heaven? Now, some of the pyramids and vision, but that's not until 1905. Yeah, okay, go on, Jeff. I just was going to say what you said. Okay, right. So what we do have is we have the time prophecies that point to that and the scriptures that show that Christ began this work. So the question people have asked me, well, what's the supernatural event about July 18th? We need some kind of supernatural confirmation. Well, wouldn't all of this chronology since July 18th be a supernatural confirmation? The studies that we did in um, uh, the book of Judges and all these spans of time or the studies that we're doing presently in Daniel chapter 11 and the symbolic use of the Strong's numbers and the spans of time, things that are impossible to have occurred by chance. You know, and remember you know, November 9th, 2019, I'm going to confirm that date, right? And, and we're going to believe that it's about this battle between the king of the north and the king of the south. But if you take the Strong's numbers for the king of the north and the king of the south and you add them together, it's the number of days um, from uh, my birth uh, to November 9th, 2019. Now, now some people would say, well, that means you think you're a prophet or Samuel Snow or things like that. But no, that's not what's implied at all. It just shows that God has the wonderful number, has created this structure of dates, symbols, um, of, of our birthdays. You know, no way that I'm a prophet, right? I'm just... One of you, right? We're, we're all really nobodies. Nobody cares who we are, except God. 
And God loves us and he is using us as we allow him to. And, and he has foreseen, um, the events that have happened in our lives and in his providence, he has provided, he has given, um, all of these numbers and dates and symbols so that we can have a sure foundation for our feet. Now, it's our personal experience that, you know, we're going to focus upon, and I'm going to, in these, this series, you know, focus a lot upon what happened to me personally. And, and I hope in that people that, that you can also identify with that on how this message has affected your walk with God. That it's not just been about um, a bunch of numbers and dates and symbols and mathematical coincidences. That what we have experienced in this movement has been a, a revelation of Jesus Christ. That we have, we have come face to face with the wonderful number. And he has affected our lives in such a way that... Um, we have been destroyed, right? Undone. And that, that work is continuing, right? I know, I know that, yeah, I know, I know that uh, this message, as we would coin it, that uh, prior, prior to that, for about 20 years attending church and so on, uh, countless revelation seminars and so on that I began to think and feel that um, I was just coasting and that I knew everything that I needed to know and I could teach it and so on and just coasting at church and I began to um, I, I don't know lose the spark per se as you know going through the actions no, the only thing and, uh, uh, just this, this message revived Sorry. So the other thing this message revived me. This message revived me. Yeah. So one of the things that happens though, you, you can agree that in in facing this message, it is actually in a sense partly responsible for the direction that your life has taken the last few years, which you would say is not good, right? I don't, how would it be responsible? Well, in the sense that it's when we come face to face with truth oh hold on back up I, I think i see i think i see july 7 2013 the seventh day of the seventh month it was quite interesting that was the day of my my disfellowship mm -hmm. uh bushwhack <laughs> yeah and and and, th and that would be you know without getting into your personal life something that really i think did affect you the fact that the church disfellowshipped you and and even more though than you, I realized, more than I realized yeah. at the time, more than I realized at the time, and when I when I when I stood uh, before the, my brothers and sisters, mm -hmm. uh, I realized what a monumental day it was because uh, the church had been my life for since I was a teenager, mm -hmm. you know, and they were, they were uh, casting me out. But you know, I'm not the guy to sit in the dirt and eat worms about things like that. But uh, it was just an amazing experience in many ways. Yeah. And, and so this is the thing is, you know, sometimes we judge something before it's time. That it is ultimately in the end, all of our experience is going to be demonstrated to be that the work is going to be demonstrated to be of God or of man. And for us individually, we have to decide, is God working in our lives? Is he showing us our need of him? Are we becoming more dependent upon him and less dependent upon ourselves? And I believe that the exposure to God's word in its correct light creates a dependence upon God. But when we trust in men, it creates a dependence upon men and it's demonstrated in how we see ourselves. We see ourselves better than we are. And and so we need to I, I, see I would, that we are not better than others. I, I, I would, when when we say that uh, exposure to God's word, now what you know that's a phrase in English, but 
how does that look like? Like you, you, you mentioned something and, and, and I'll add, yeah, the, the experience of July 7, 2013 and the disfellowship did affect me and, and also in negative ways, in ways of, uh, feeling like, uh, cast out, but well, not really you. acknowledging it. And yeah, yeah. And not really acknowledging it as much as it did. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, the, yeah, and then and then it caused me to make choices that were inside of me, urging me that I they were sneaking up, sneaking up, you know, to uh, backslide and so on. And and then one day it was like I didn't see that coming, and uh, a three year journey back. It yeah. was a, quite a track, quite a track. But I've always, you know, and this of course I've known you since I was what twelve years old. Um, you know to look at your life and what God has brought you through uh, to me is, is um, a strong encouragement because you've come out of some pretty terrible situations and and my wife, the same with Heidi. Um, And uh, so I think that, you know, as we, we focus upon what God's word is revealing to us, that it is revealing to us, something about ourselves um, because we're being exposed to Christ. This light is shining into this darkness and we don't like it um, because we don't want our deeds to be exposed. But the more we trust in Christ, uh, the more we can see that how Christ leads. And and to me, the witness of July 18th is, is what happened after July 18th that shows it was of God. I was I right. was just gonna say I was just gonna say that the exposure to God's word and showing us ourselves that experience or realization I can't remember a time when it came before it happened but after it happened verses single verses would pop off the page randomly sometimes open to and it was like wow now I understand <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, thanks for that, Kelly. Let's uh, close in prayer. Uh, Dear gracious Heavenly Father, uh, we are so thankful for the things that you do in our lives and the way that you lead. And we just pray, Lord, that we can encourage one another, not just in prayer, but with our words. Um, And we pray, Lord, that we can know your presence, your angels care and protection and your spirit speaking to us. And we pray for one another. We pray for this movement. We pray for elder Jeff, who we love so much. And um, we are sorrowful for the decisions that he has made, but we know Lord that you can preserve him. And for others, Lord, who have struggled in various ways and things, ways that we cannot comprehend. And so we give our hearts to you, our lives to you, and ask that you can use us. We ask for forgiveness for our sins, the times that we have walked away from you, we have turned away from the light because it was too hard to bear, not realizing that that light was the source of life and power and joy and peace and love. And so we ask, Lord, that we can walk towards that light and embrace it in spite of the fact that it's going to show us our defects of character or maybe for the reason that it does. Thank you for the Sabbath. Be with each person today. And we pray and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.